The following program was produced by the Theosophical Society in America. Thank you all for coming tonight and uh, for everybody who's watching us uh, on the internet. I'd like to thank you for taking time to come and listen as well. The uh, second object of the Theosophical Society is to encourage the comparative study of religion, science, and philosophy. And uh, here at the uh, Center for the American Section, oftentimes when we open up a program, such as the Thursday night lecture or the open mic, uh, we, re we give our mission statement, which draws from the three objects. And uh, you may have noticed that when we give the portion that gives a nod to the second object, we append the arts onto the end. So we say that we encourage the comparative study of religion, science, philosophy, and the arts. And uh, this is somewhat of a break from tradition, but I really do think that it's just as well that we do this. Uh, the second object, really at the core of it, is synthesis. And from some points of view, uh, there are those who even say that theosophy is essentially a synthesis of religion, science, and philosophy. And it occurs to me that synthesis is really the keynote of art done well. Um, when you think of any art form, whether it be painting, sculpture, or poetry, you really have two things going on. Uh, you have sort of a technical skill being practiced. Uh, to steady your hand and to build skill in painting requires practice, training. Uh, there's lots of theory behind that. But then there's the other side of art, or uh, true art, as Kandinsky would say, uh, is the heart and soul that we put into it. And uh, the, the true artist, he would say, is somebody who's able to bring these things together. And uh, really, this is true in any field, whether it be the arts, whether it be religion, science, or philosophy. Um, there are scientists, but uh, then there are people like Albert Einstein, who uh, not to knock his technical skill in science, but many people are of the opinion that what was really extraordinary about Einstein was his vision. He had these ideas about a different world and a different sort of physics, which he then later proved. He was able to imagine these things, sort of stretch the boundaries of the possible, and bring something truly inspiring to the masses. And I think that this is really what sets some people apart. Uh, no matter what their field, is that occasionally there are people who are able to do whatever it is that they do with great artistry, with great poetry and talent. And uh, Vasily Kandinsky is certainly one such person. This is an image of Kandinsky. He was uh, born December 4th, 1866 in Moscow. He was born to a wealthy family. His father owned a tea factory. And uh, so at the time, uh, he was very well educated. And he was exposed to art at a young age. He was trained in the piano and the cello, um, lots of things like that. From a very young age, it became apparent to everybody around him that he was very sensitive to the impact on the mind and the soul to things like color. Uh, in fact, he was even quoted as a very young boy as saying, each color lives by its mysterious life. So even back then, this is something that he felt with his heart and soul. Uh, despite his exposure to the arts at a young age, in school he pursued a career in law. He studied law and economics. And he did this very, very well. Uh, at the age of 30, he was offered a professorship at the University of Dorpat. But he must have felt some longing in his soul because he decided to give up this promising career. And he was really, he was begged to stay. Um, he could have had a life of incredible wealth and prestige, but he decided, I'd really like to study art instead. So at the age of 30, he moved to Munich. And he studied art under uh, an artist of some renown named Anton Asba. And at this, too, he excelled. He uh, had great technical skill. Um, he learned very quickly. Um, but there was a sort of a turning point in his artistic career when he went to a gallery and he viewed Monet's haystacks, um, which are actually presently on display at the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, I've seen them. And basically what they were, were they were a study done by Monet. There was a field with some bales of hay that were stacked up in it. And he kept visiting this field at different times of the day, in different light conditions, and at different angles. And he painted these same haystacks over and over again. 
And when Kandinsky saw these paintings, he was incredibly moved by them, but he was also somewhat disturbed. And there's a quote from one of his journals regarding one of the works that he saw. That it was a haystack, the catalog informed me. I could not recognize it. This non-recognition was painful to me. I considered that the painter had no right to paint indistinctly. I dully felt that the object of the painting was missing. And I noticed, with surprise and confusion, that the picture not only gripped me, but impressed itself ineradicably on my memory. Painting took on a fairy tale power and splendor. So upon seeing this work of art, Kandinsky sort of felt these conflicting reactions. Um, from the standpoint of an artist, um, the standpoint of technical skill, he was a bit put off by the fact that the painting is so loose in its depiction of the haystacks. You really kind of have to know that that's what they are uh, to appreciate them in that sense. But at the same time, he felt so moved by them and compelled. And this uh, actually set off a transformation in his studies of art. Um, he began playing hooky from class, just skipping it all together to take his art materials and go paint still lifes of his own all by himself. And uh, he got in a lot of trouble for this, but uh, he didn't really care. This was what his soul told him to do. This was what he felt the need to do uh, to express himself as an artist. Um, it wasn't long before he actually just left school altogether, just like he did uh, with his law career. Uh, he felt compelled to leave this sort of conventional path behind. And in 1901, uh, he formed a progressive art group called Phalanx. Uh, and he, uh, this eventually formed into his very own art school. So um, before he had completed art school, he took it upon himself to sort of educate others in art. Um, by 1909, he helped to form the New Artists Association in Munich. And this was sort of a movement of a new impulse in art. Uh, this was sort of the seminal steps that he began taking towards his later basic revolution of the field of art. Um, so we see he has this propensity for leadership. Uh, he's a very strong, independent, and uh, willful figure. Uh, who just does what he feels the need to from the inside. And he served as the president of this New Art Association, uh, a group which was very successful for a couple of years. Uh, but eventually, there was sort of a split that formed within the group. Uh, there was one group of the artists uh, that, despite the progressive bent of the group, just from Kandinsky's point of view anyway, couldn't really pry themselves away from the traditional art techniques. And then there were those in the school that were more along Kandinsky's line of thinking. And so eventually this, uh, this association split apart. Uh, everybody went their separate ways. And in the same year, Kandinsky wrote the book Concerning the Spiritual in Art. And uh, as far as abstract art is concerned, um, this is basically the foundation for it. He, he wrote out his theories concerning abstract art. And, uh, in this very book, he, he, he mentions specifically uh, his inspiration by the Theosophical Society, by the writings of HPB, that's Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, uh, specifically her book, Key to Theosophy. He really saw the Theosophical Society as kindred with him in this new impulse. Um, and at this time, uh, after writing this book, he formed yet another art group called The Blue Writer with artists uh, August Mackey and Franz Marc. And uh, this set off a very rapid evolution in his theory and his technique. Uh, this is the painting after which Blue Rider was named. It's called the Blue Rider. And as we look at the painting, there are certain features that really stand out. It's painted in somewhat of an impressionistic style. It's not definite in its depiction. Uh, and in this, it has a lot in common with Monet's haystacks. Um, now, there's a rider on the horse, and one of the first things about the horse that's of note to anybody who's spent a lot of time around horses is that the position that the horse is in is physically impossible for a horse. And it's almost certain that Kandinsky would have known this when he painted this. And so the supposition is that he did this intentionally. And as far as the rider is concerned, you can sort of see underneath the rider this indistinct black shadow. Now, what is it? Uh, is this a shadow of the writer itself? Uh, is this another person that the writer is huddling? 
And it came to light later that Kandinsky did all of this on purpose. He wanted to make this painting indistinct in its form as a way of drawing the viewer into the painting. And by so doing, he made art kind of a participatory process, uh, something we normally think of as a passive process of viewing, taking in the art. Here we're compelled to project onto the piece, sort of make a story. Uh, this is a perfect example of uh, art taking on a fairy tale quality and splendor. Uh, the period after uh, the Blue Rider was his absolute most productive period. Uh, it was a four-year period in which he just completely revolutionized his art theory, his art practice. Uh, he stopped painting pictures like this at all and eventually made a complete divorce from what he called art for art's sake. Uh, this is an example of a piece that he produced during that time. Now, his, uh, his perspectives on art were actually met with some violence and uh, great criticism. Um, for the main reason that art, up until that point, really emphasized, or painting, it, it emphasized a representational approach. The, uh, the goal in art was to paint really impressive, technical, beautiful pictures that accurately depicted something. Or even if the intention of the artist was to invoke some feeling, it was by some familiar scene, you know, uh, sort of the human condition. And uh, Kandinsky sort of insisted that this was not necessary in art. And in fact, in Concerning the Spiritual in Art, uh, there's a very uh, eloquent passage in which he describes art for art's sake. Um, he describes a group of people traipsing through an art gallery, sort of passively taking in these paintings without much real thought or appreciation. He describes it as a very dull process. Um, people might be amazed by the technical skill, but they leave the gallery unmoved in their soul. So it was Kandinsky's goal to stir the soul with his paintings. And to do this, he moved away from a representational approach. When you really think about it, even though this was revolutionary at the time, it shouldn't have been. There are other art forms, such as music, that already have that same object. When we listen to a song, it's never really the intention of the composer to depict a scene or to accurately reproduce something physical. Instead, you're aiming for a, a connection at the soul level. And Kandinsky very seriously believed that this was the object of art. To him, even if you did paint a painting that was technically marvelous, the idea is to invoke these feelings. And in fact, he began to use musical terminology to describe his artwork. He called some pieces improvisations, and some of his more famous works were called composition. This right here is composition seven. Um, so music just sort of entered into his artwork. And uh, as I'll describe later on, it was a very crucial part to his art theory. Um, in 1921, uh, Kandinsky once again showed his bent for leadership by joining the Bauhaus. And this is a piece from that period. The Bauhaus in Germany was actually an academy founded by Walter Gropius. Uh, if anybody uh, in the local Chicago area is familiar with the controversy surrounding a hospital that was going to be bulldozed in the plans for the 2016 Olympics to make room, he designed those hospitals. So the Bauhaus was actually primarily an architectural school. But uh, Kandinsky was asked to come and uh, teach at that school, and he was a leading figure there. Uh, he taught classes in advanced art theory, and it was here that he sort of developed and built on his art theory that began in concerning the spiritual in art and built the technical angles in a, a, a piece called Point and Line to Plane. Uh, compared to concerning the spiritual in art, um, this book is not so poetic. He literally goes into the art theory of how you build a piece of art like this. Uh, he called it the science of art which is kind of ironic when you think about that what he was doing was trying to go at the heart and soul of something. And this seems like a contradicting approach then. If his whole attitude was of soul expression, why would he bring this technical bent into it? But uh, some reflection on why he might have done that yields some interesting results. Uh, so his artwork began to emphasize geometry and form. And that's what we see in this piece here. There are lots of sort of sharp and angular elements to this piece. Uh, definitely structured. Uh, the Bauhaus 
was uh, under incredible stress from the Nazi regime to end its activities. They were, uh, they were not very happy. And the Bauhaus had to move several times uh, during its career and eventually just had to be completely shut down. After the Bauhaus period, Kandinsky moved to Paris, where he basically completed his magnum opus, his life's work of finishing his series of compositions. And this here is his final composition, Composition 10. Uh, to the naked eye, it seems a little bit chaotic, um, sort of loose. But the truth about all of his compositions, and really all three of the pieces that I've shown here so far is that there isn't a single element of these pieces of art that he didn't spend considerable time thinking about and planning out. He, uh, in the theory that he developed in Point and Line to Plane, he sort of developed this science. And so we see here that even the most tiny point in the artwork, the little dots that we see around the edge of the artwork, every swirl and every curve was skillfully intended to create a certain reaction in the viewer. Uh, he strongly believed that color and geometrical form all carried certain vibrations. He described this as vibrations that affected the viewer on a spiritual level. So um, oftentimes uh, when we view abstract art, especially if we're new to it and not familiar with these ideas, we think, what is that? We'll see you know, a crazy sculpture that looks like just a bunch of bent metal, and we think to ourselves, why would somebody do this? It literally baffles the mind, and what, what we don't realize, I myself thought this until I studied Kandinsky, is that that's never the point. The point is what the pieces invoke inside you, the uh, resonance between the soul of the viewer and what's painted on the canvas. So now I'm going to spend some time talking about some of the geometric theory and some of the color theory that goes behind the work of Kandinsky. Uh, we have here an example of the emblem of the Theosophical Society in America. And pretty much the centerpiece of this rendition of the emblem is the geometry. It's geometrical forms that are explaining profound ideas. And I'd like to stress as I go through this next section that these ideas are not necessarily those of Kandinsky, but they are meant to illustrate some of the effects that he might have been aiming to bring about in people with his pieces. And uh, the first shape that we're going to explore is the triangle. And the reason for that is that it's the simplest polygon. You cannot have a polygon with two sides. So the triangle is the three-sided polygon. And if you just spend some time maybe close your eyes and picture the image of a triangle. There's certain characteristics that a triangle has. It's a very edgy shape. It sort of sometimes invokes maybe the idea of a flame. It's dynamic, it's energetic, and kind of radiating in a sense. Um, on a more philosophical level, the triangle is the, uh, the structure of trinity. And what's going on in a trinity is you have two polar forces, maybe uh, yin and yang, um, male and female, and they come together and generate something that contains characteristics of both. So thereby the triangle also represents the process of generation or creation. Um, theosophically, there are literal attributions that we put to a triangle uh, in the, uh, the human individual and the human constitution. We call this the upper triad of uh, Atma, Buddhi, Manas. And this is really just a fancy Sanskrit way of referring to that highest aspect of ourselves that uh, continually reincarnates from life to life. Atma being the, uh, the spark of divinity that we're given that's closest to uh, the absolute creation. Um, Buddhi being that spiritual force that ensouls us in everything that we do. And Manas describing the higher mind which is the, uh, that part of our mind that deals with abstract thought. These are considered theosophically to be the highest aspects of humanity that endure throughout all time. And they're symbolized by the triangle. In the, uh, the seal of the Theosophical Society, we have two triangles that are interlaced. And the, uh, the black one that's pointing downward symbolizes also the process of what we call involution. And this is basically the descent of spirit into matter. 
uh, we have the absolute spiritual force or consciousness that in souls matter and actually produces matter. And we're going to, uh, I'll be elaborating on some of this in a later part of the talk. Um, at the same time, the white triangle that's pointing upward illustrates the theosophical idea of the evolution of consciousness in matter. So after consciousness has imbued matter and crystallized itself in form, then there is the task of evolving back upwards towards divinity. And in Concerning the Spiritual in Art, Kandinsky had a lot to say about the triangle that is taken straight out of theosophical ideas. And I'm going to read an excerpt from that. Kandinsky writes, the life of the spirit may, f may be fairly represented in a diagram as a large, acute angled triangle divided horizontally into unequal parts with the narrowest segment uppermost. The lower the segment, the greater it is in breadth, depth, and area. The whole triangle is moving slowly, almost invisibly forwards and upwards. At the apex of the top segment stands often one man and only one. His joyful vision cloaks a vast sorrow. Even those who are nearest to him in sympathy do not understand him. Angrily they abuse him as charlatan or madman. So in his lifetime stood Beethoven, solitary and insulted. In every segment of the triangle are artists. Each one of them who can see beyond the limits of his segment is a prophet to those about him and helps the advance of the obstinate whole. The greater the segment, which is the same as saying the lower it lies in the triangle, so the greater the number who understand the words of the artist. Every segment hungers consciously or much more often unconsciously for their corresponding spiritual food. This food is offered by the artists and for this food the segment immediately below will tomorrow be stretching out eager hands. So what we have here is sort of an eloquent description of the upward progression of consciousness or in Kandinsky's case humanity and um, it's notable that he puts one man or one, I would say, individual at the top of this triangle. And the top being the narrowest part is the part that can contain the fewest people. So Kandinsky's recognizing here that there are those who are sort of a little bit more advanced than the rest of humanity and sort of serve as the vanguard of advancing evolution. And this finds strong resonance with the theosophical concept of the masters who are said to be perfected human beings, or at least as perfect as you can be in the human evolution, who now spend every waking moment guiding the rest of humanity. And that as you go further and further down the triangle, you find more and more people. And uh, the point being, though, he constantly emphasizes the upward movement. Uh, in the last line here, he mentions, and for this food, the segment immediately below will tomorrow be stretching out eager hands. So he sees everything as an upward progression, and I'm certain that he saw his own artistic work in this same light. Next, I don't have a visual example of one, but we'll talk about the square. So if you envision a square, the geometric form in your mind, the square is symbolic of stability, foundation, solidity, and material construction. It's a very stout and sturdy form. Uh, we often refer to the building blocks of any given thing, whether they be a building or a concept or a project. The building blocks, referring to the square form, are the pieces that we lay in as we build a monument to something. And it also corresponds symbolically in the theosophical teaching to the, what's called the lower quaternary. Now, as opposed to the upper triad, the ever-enduring spiritual atma buddhi manas, we have the lower quaternary, which consists of sort of our lower vehicles, being the physical body, the etheric double, which is essentially a copy of the physical body that sort of forms a blueprint for it, prana, which is the ensouling life force that energizes these bodies, and then kama manas, which is the complement to upper manas or buddhi manas, Kama manas being sort of the combination of mind with our desire nature. Uh, this is that aspect of our mind that's directed towards the physical planes, mm -hmm. towards the concrete things in life, and all that is finite and passing. Finally, we have the circle. With no corners, it's less stimulating than the square or the triangle. It's more placid and soothing. 
It's considered by many to be the most spiritual shape for many reasons, uh, the first of which being that a circle is basically that perimeter that's defined by all points that are of equal distance from a center. And there's a great deal of spiritual symbolism in this. Um, the idea that there's sort of this ever-enduring spiritual center of the universe and the circle depicting all as being in the same distance from that. It equalizes us. Uh, when we sit at a conference table, if it's round, um, there's an equality of discussion that goes on. There's no person that's emphasized over any other. Uh, the circle also invokes the concept of cyclicity, um, sort of a revolving process, a turning process. And this, too, Kandinsky often referred to in ways that parallel the theosophical teachings. Uh, again, he wrote in Concerning the Spiritual in Art, every work of art is the child of its age. And he goes on to describe Greek architecture, uh, the fact that any given age will produce a certain kind of art form that reflects sort of the spirit and the soul of that age. And further, he goes to say that in this age, we may attempt to reproduce the Greek architecture, but that if we do so from sort of an empty, technical, merely imitative stance, that it will be devoid of soul and meaning. But conversely, he wrote, there is, however, in art, another kind of external similarity which is founded on a fundamental truth. When there is a similarity of inner tendency in the whole moral and spiritual atmosphere, a similarity of ideals, at first closely pursued but later lost to sight, a similarity in the inner feeling of any one period to that of another, the logical result will be a revival of the external forms which serve to express those inner feelings in an earlier age. An example of this today is our sympathy, our spiritual relationship with the primitives. Like ourselves, these artists sought to express in their work only internal truths, renouncing in consequence all consideration of external form. And uh, when he refers to our spiritual relationship, our sympathy, I think he was probably referring to abstract artists, those who were divorcing themselves in artwork from the depiction of material forms. This speaks of cyclicity. What we have here, what he's describing is an art form um, by a people who have not yet really even evolved art to the point of technical expertise and even attempting to depict uh, certain forms. Then there's the evolution sort of upwards towards this pinnacle of technical expertise of which examples we see in Italy, uh, the perfect uh, depictions of human form and then a return to this same idea of just inner expression, but maybe from a higher perspective, bringing with us everything that we have gained from this process of evolving into art. So we have sort of this vision of an up and down movement or perhaps an ascending spiral that takes us ever higher and higher into forms of expression that encompass everything that came before them. As for the uh, impact of color, um, a lot of this is pretty obvious and uh, notable just upon mentioning some of the phrases that we use in our day-to-day -day language. Uh, we often speak of feeling blue as that sense of depression, that sort of dark, looming blue that hangs over somebody who's depressed. Seeing red depicting anger and aggression. Green with envy. Bright daytime sky as opposed to an evening sunset. Color's very powerful. Um, we have here sort of this placid indigo color surrounding the picture, but imagine if I had used sort of a bright yellow to depict that instead, or maybe a red. It would change the whole tone and the whole meaning. This is a very intuitive thing, which Kandinsky broke down to an exact science in, uh, in point and line to plane. Now, these ideas that he has of depicting these kind of abstract forms uh, find resonance and inspiration from some other theosophists um, notably Charles Leadbeater uh, and Rudolf Steiner, two who very strongly influenced Kandinsky. And uh, we'll get to how in just a minute, but to sort of understand why these, these theosophists had the impact that they did on Kandinsky, we need to look at another quote from him in his essay on the question of form. He stated, even dead matter is living spirit. So what he's saying here is that there is no such thing as dead and empty matter. 
uh, which is really strange coming from a person who's just gotten done explaining why some art is dead, but I digress. There is a uh, sort of a foundation in the theosophical teachings for stating this same truth. And theosophy, uh, this is the, uh, what, what's called the lead beater chart. And this is a chart of the manifestation of uh, all of existence. And for our purposes here, we're going to ignore all of this technical stuff over here. The main point is that this chart sort of depicts a continuum between spirit and matter. We can put spirit up here at the top of the chart and matter down here at the bottom of the chart. And uh, we find in the writings of HPB that spirit and matter are just connected. They're as one. They're two sides to the same coin. Um, and the degree to which we can perceive this would be dependent upon where we stand in this spectrum here. Up here at the top of the spectrum, you have absolutely no separation. You have no distinct forms. You have only pure consciousness. So the matter aspect in the stuff of the universe is latent, sort of infolded into the spirit. And as spirit descends, it gradually coalesces forms. While here on the physical plane, we have the matter aspect dominant. Uh, everything is solid. Everything is separate here. Uh, the, uh, our reality, anyway, is that of separation and drudgery, so to speak. Every stage in between represents sort of a step closer to this center point here um, of the buddhic plane. But essentially, the astral plane is said to be uh, sort of a realm. We can consider it maybe uh, a different bandwidth um, from the physical. If we think in terms of vibrations, we have radio waves that are constantly surrounding us right now, but just outside the range of our perception. So as we step up from the physical plane, the spirit aspect in matter gradually unfolds and comes out, and matter becomes more responsive to consciousness itself, to impulses of the mind or the perception of perhaps a human individual or the monad. And this sort of forms the underpinning for the ideas and the experiences of Charles Leadbeater and Annie Besant that had such a strong impact on Kandinsky. Uh, essentially, Leadbeater and Besant were both clairvoyant. They, uh, they had developed psychic faculties that allowed them to perceive these planes that are above the physical plane. Um, and many of the things that they saw in these planes, they described, not for the sake of uh, sort of being enamored by them, but really for the sake of their practical application in uh, a spiritual life. Uh, the phenomenon that are held to be the chief inspiration for Kandinsky to paint these strange forms on his canvases are thought forms. Uh, and the basic idea here, uh, as described by Steiner and Besant and Leadbeater, is that as a human being experiences emotions or thinks thoughts, they produce these forms from their astral bodies and their mental bodies. This painting here is a picture of the astral body as Charles Leadbeater saw it. It's sort of a field that, if it were brought down to the physical level, would be seen to sort of surround the human body in an egg shape. Here again, we see the incidence of the, uh, the deep meaning of color, because every thought and feeling that we experience causes waves of color in our astral and mental bodies, uh, corresponding with whatever level we're experiencing. So for example, these colors of blue that we see up here, rather than being depressive, when they're in their vibrant form, Leadbeater said they, they represented uh, devotion, sort of a, a spiritual devotional feeling. Uh, we have these sort of Rose colors here are said to signify affection. And the observations of Leadbeater and Besant, of individuals and of the thought forms that they produced, were that as we experience these emotions, we produce these things. And these thought forms were actually said to have a direct effect on other human beings when they would travel to others and find resonance with those human beings. So Kandinsky found this all to be very inspiring. And it could be said that, in a sense, what he was trying to do was create physical representations of these thought forms. He would capture a feeling or an emotion, and he would hang on to it. And he would do everything he could to reproduce it in a painting so that others could experience it. For example, one of the things he did as, a, as an exercise was he took the word deluge, and he repeated it to himself over and over in his head until it lost all meaning. 
just to experience what it was that that invoked in him and spent incredible time and energy putting this onto a canvas, constantly editing it, changing it, until he got it just right. Uh, one of the other things that Kandinsky talked about, uh, which is pretty evident in his sort of automatic stance towards art of being related to music, was sort of a vision of the arts gradually merging into one. Uh, he talked about the coming together of painting with music in ways that he could scarcely imagine at the time. Uh, incidentally, uh, another one of the things that, according to Leadbeater, produces forms on the astral plane is music. And uh, there were many paintings that were produced of the music forms that Leadbeater could see. So we have here an example of what Leadbeater perceived above a cathedral as the music of Gounod was played within it. And I just think it's really interesting if we were to line this up next to this. There's a lot of similarities here. And furthermore, to get a sense of some of the ideas I've described, I'd also like to go through these paintings one more time and just spend some time absorbing each one. What does this painting do? We have a white background, which radiates sort of this essence, perhaps, of purity. And then contrasted with that, we have all these geometric forms of many different colors, most of which are sharp, pointy, giving sort of an abrasive or explosive sense. And then there's that explosive feeling as these forms radiate outward from the center, too. But then we also have these subtly curved lines here that are placed very skillfully. And we get the sense that as Kandinsky created these works of art, he was balancing these forces, probably in ways that we couldn't understand with our concrete minds. We could read point and line to plane. We could study that book and the principles within it and still never produce anything quite like Kandinsky's artwork. Here we have something altogether more busy. There's really not much of a background to speak of. All in this picture is activity. There's just this maelstrom of form, but we also have less of an emphasis on the geometric pointy figures that emphasize separateness. Instead, we have flowing curves and splotches of color that denote affection, connection. Uh, but it's tumultuous. The overall feeling is of great activity. There's a lot going on here. Sometimes I wonder if this is actually the piece that he painted when he was thinking of the word deluge, but I don't know. And then finally, we have Composition 10, which was like his final piece. And it's different from the rest. It actually seems to have elements in common with them both. It's much more active than the first one. There's much more here, but there's also that tendency towards curvature rather than geometric form. We have the black background, which completely changes the tone of the piece, throws it in a totally different direction. We have these hieroglyphic-like uh, inscriptions here. Uh, Kandinsky literally wanted these to sort of invoke the idea of the written word without the attachment that would come with actually putting real words on his piece. So in closing, keeping in mind the vision of Leadbeater here of the forms that are created by the music of Gounod and also the idea that Kandinsky had about the evolution and the eventual merger of the different forms of art, I'd just like to end this presentation with some thoughts and some speculations about what it all means. Today we actually have many examples of this sort of synthesized form of art that Kandinsky talked about. I remember when I was younger going to the Denver Planetarium and seeing a laser show that, where the lasers were sort of dancing with music. This is perhaps the kind of thing that Kandinsky was talking about. Uh, Windows Media Player comes to mind. For anybody who's played a song on a computer program, Windows Media Player, iTunes, and watched the graphics dance to the music, this is something very similar. Uh, but there's a deeper way of understanding this, too, because theosophy uh, the writings of Blavatsky and Leadbeater and Besant suggest to us that as humanity evolves, we'll actually sort of rise up off of the physical plane. Um, our consciousness will be focused on the astral plane, which is where Leadbeater sees things like this happening. And uh, there's another theosophist of some renown named Jeffrey Hodson, who is also clairvoyant. And 
he tended to focus on the activity of what's called the Deva kingdom, which is another way of saying the angelic kingdom. Uh, he had a deep relationship with the Devas that he could perceive. And one of the things he wrote about quite often was their color language, um, that they didn't communicate to each other in words. They sort of communicated to each other in flowing forms of color that communicated their ideas much more distinctly than our words ever could because they were a direct expression, an immediate response from the thoughts of these beings. And if this is just what a conversation looks like, a statement between a deva, imagine what kind of art forms we might have in the future. I think it's really quite amazing. So uh, Kandinsky, in the revolution that he brought about in art, uh, showed a tremendous vision. Um, the fact that he had this gift to give to everybody, uh, despite the, uh, the great scorn that he faced, uh, his willingness to give up a prestigious career in law and economics to pursue this and to give this to humanity is a great testament to his character. And he's definitely one of those great figures that I mentioned in the beginning who not only did what he did well with technical skill and expertise, but infused his work with a life of spirit. Uh, he really poured his heart into everything. So thank you very much. And I guess I will open the floor to questions. We have the microphone. Uh, we, we have a microphone to go around. I don't know what the uh, the orthodoxy of the theosophical um, presentation of things is, but uh, does Swedenborg have anything to do with this uh, kind of um, I don't know geometry of uh, experience and a kind of a, uh, a building of um, I'd call it some, for lack of a better term, transcendence, which seemed to be an object of Swedenborg's thought. I'm actually probably going to have to be bailed out here because I don't really know anything about Swedenborg. So. Outside of that kind of blanket, you know, but he seemed to be contemporary with uh, the From what I have studied of Swedenborg, there was a lot of resonance. Swedenborg was very interested in the life of the spirit as opposed to sort of the, the maybe the dead letter of religion or in other words, the technical expertise of religion. He would have been maybe a Kandinsky of religion. Yeah, and on the other hand, any technical consideration of philosophy per se, he seemed to take that route. It's mm -hmm. a good observation. Do you think Kandinsky was a clairvoyant in some way that he could see some of the thought forms, especially because of that remark when he was a child? Is there any reference or what do you think? Well, there's one, but it's disputed, which is why I didn't put it in my talk. Um, but uh, there was actually a situation in which he, uh, he attended an opera or something along those lines. I'm not remembering who the musician was right now, but uh, he described allegedly an experience that to me sounded very clairvoyant. He described this piece as invoking not only emotions in his mind, but colors. And he described the music as very yellow uh, and green. And uh, it was a very lively experience for him. Um, I don't think he ever came out as saying that he literally visually saw these things, but at the very least, uh, he was sensitive enough that all of this stimulated his mind's eye. So uh, if it's accepted that clairvoyance exists, I believe at the very least he had the buddings of it, the sort of the beginnings of it. Sure. Seems like a very limited palette of colors. Oh, I'm sorry. It seems like a very limited uh, palette of colors, like earth tones only. Is, is that? In this particular piece? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is. And in fact, uh, in the book that this comes from, Thought Forms, which was co-authored by Besant and Leadbeater, uh, Annie Besant specifically speaks to the inadequacy of the earth tones that they had available to them to capture the living fire that they were able to see. So uh, that's a good observation. I've noticed that too. Um, and you, you also have to picture this as moving, kind of dancing with the music, much like a Windows Media Player visualization. This is very much a dynamic thing. It's quite something, though. 
When was this done? When was this piece for done? I honestly don't know. Um, I don't remember the name of the artist, but it was an associate of Annie Besant and Charles Leadbeater's. It was somebody that they both knew, and uh, they spent a considerable amount of time describing what they saw to this artist. And I'm sure there were many drafts of things like this before what they arrived. Frame were they in? 1910, 1920, okay. Something like same that. Time. It would have been about the same time then that Kandinsky wrote concerning the spiritual in art. 1910, 1920. Yeah. Thereabouts. Yes. I just wanted to comment that your whole talk was uh, very meaningful to me as a painter and as someone who uh, has been more involved with line for a long time, and I'm rediscovering color, and um, I used to paint to music, and that would evoke the colors, uh, but the whole talk just um, meant, you know, it, it hit me as being very um, meaningful and true, so uh, thank you. Oh. You're welcome. Um, it could be said that I did my job in giving the talk, but I really feel more that uh, Kandinsky did his job um, very well uh, to produce that in you, because really all I've done is tried to impart some of what he saw. Well, you did it well. Well, uh, I would recommend, uh, if, if you like to read, um, we have in our library here concerning the spiritual in art. And the excerpts that I read were from it, but he just speaks so eloquently and poetically in that book. He really makes this come to life. So, okay. um, I have a question. You uh, had a quote when you were showing the triangle. What was that taken from? That was the same book. It was called <clears throat> "Concerning the Spiritual in Art." Um, it depends on the translation because he wrote it in Russian, and some people translate it as "On the Spiritual in Art." And that's in this library? We do have it in this library, yes. Uh, I also know that it's available online. There's a, a, it's a public domain book, so it's available online in free versions to read as well. Very inexpensive. Yeah. Um, I'd also like to re uh, let you know that we had an uh, article by Gary Lachman um, in an issue of Quest Magazine on Kandinsky. Uh, the issue's theme was uh, finding theosophy in unexpected places. And this is a, although we, we encourage uh, the, the artistic and um, connection, it, we, we added on. Um, it's not, not the first place you, you think to find, find theosophy. No, it's not. But, but, uh, Interestingly enough, it's one of the places where theosophy is really active and vibrant in its expression at the same time. And I'll, I'd also like to comment that it seems that there's some larger impulse sort of coursing through the society because uh, not only Gary Lockman, but John Algio has written an article on this. And it's, it's a subject that's gotten some attention recently. So there's plenty out there for uh, anybody who wants to explore this a little bit further. <laughs> 